Hello, everyone. Welcome to a Nuevo Huevo book uh, launch. Um, today is a release party for Juan Felipe Herrera's uh, book, um, Every Day We Get More Illegal, and uh, also for Anthony Cody's um, Borderland Apocrypha. Um, I'm Graciela. I'm your host tonight. Um, I am the new vice president of QA, of the Chicanx Writers and Artists Association. Um, we just wanted to let you guys know that this school year is actually the 30th anniversary of QA on campus. And this is our first year of the, uh, our first event of the year um, to celebrate. Um, QA was started in 1990, um, in the school year of 1990-1991 by Andres Montoya and Daniel Chacon. Um, and QA is just a collective of students that seeks to diversify and politicize the creative community at Fresno State and the Central Valley through literature and art. Um, so if there's any students out there that don't know what QA is, definitely come check us out on Twitter and Instagram um, and come join the club. <laughs> um, we just wanted to give a big thanks tonight to um, the Alumni Association um, for helping us with tonight's Zoom webinar, um, especially Kareen, Nicole, and Donna, and to the Creative Writing Alumni Chapter for helping us uh, manage registrations, uh, especially, especially to Jefferson, Donald, and Camila. Um, and to the leadership of Long American Ink and Stories, another amazing club on campus um, for helping us with Zoom management tonight, especially uh, to Yia Lee. And to our sponsors who supported more than 50 students to attend tonight for free, um, especially Fresno State Provost uh, Saul Jimenez Sandoval and Connie Hales and Stephen Church. Um, and then just a few announcements before we get started. Um, we won't be answering any questions. Um, we have the webinars Q&A has been disabled, but in the chat, you can um, go ahead and cheer on your favorite readers, all of the readers. Um, we are also recommending that you use speaker view for audience members. Um, and we will be spotlighting each of the readers as they perform. Um, but yeah, we're just here tonight to um, uh, hatch the new books, as uh, the um, flyer says, to, of Juan Felipe and Anthony. Um, bef be but before we ce uh, celebrate them, we're going to hear from a lot of the fellows from the Laureate Lab. Um, those who don't know, the Laureate Lab Visual Wordist Studio is inside the Henry Madden Library at Fresno State. Um, it's a place where poetry magic happens. <laughs> it's a space for Juan Felipe, Anthony, and the labbers, all of which you will see tonight, explore the dimensions and connections of sculpture, of sculpture movements, words, performance, and mixed media. Qua is excited to share the labbers' work with you tonight and um, as a warm-up for Anthony and Juan Felipe. So our first reader tonight is JJ Hernandez. Uh, JJ is a poet in Fresno, he holds an MFA in poetry and served as one of the inaugural fellows in the Laureate Lab. His work has been supported by the community of writers, work, of writers workshop. He reads for, for the Offing magazine, and you can see some of his poetry in Tinderbox, Queen Mob's Tea House, and the American Poetry Review, among others. Take it away, JJ. Uh, hey, y'all. Um, I, th I think this is working. Um, just. Just wanted to say congrats to Anthony, as always, um, to Juan Felipe, as always. Um, both are like mentors and friends, and I'm, I'm happy and grateful to be here to celebrate and talk with them and read with them and be a part of this. This is so cool. Uh, I, I'm not being sarcastic. That's just my tone of voice. Uh, the, I, I, the, Maybe I am. Um, but again, I, I, I'm just reading a couple poems. Thanks. I love this shirt too. Uh, and we'll, we'll get going for me. Um, I, I've been trying to write poems when I can, but you know, life happens. Uh, this first poem I'm going to read is called A Nosebleed in All White in Spring. Uh, and it's just a poem I wrote um, after a drive into a mountain. Um, and yeah, a nosebleed in all white in spring. Break in a new car engine, climbing a mountain, push through the windy roads up the gulch of California canals. I can't contain the overwhelming feeling that nothing and relativity mean the same. 
in the beginning was the word. Did the word come before the creation story? Or did God, like all of us, talk to himself in the dark? I needed this to be true. But as my Honda crawls up Highway 168, I no longer want to climb Jacob's golden ladder. I have lucid dreams too. And some scripture talks about young men dreaming dreams in the last days, which sounds so, so poetic. In a nightmare, I was uploaded to a cloud and learned so much from those who were previously uploaded. They spoke to me in parables and tongues, and I was to descend back slowly like an old analog TV picture that comes into focus. While on top of the mountain, I see the majesty of a cliff and the erasure of snow. The town I grew up in is run down, but when it snows, all is blank. After a long descent, I see a car upside down in a tree. Two white kids are hanging by seat belts, but I won't stop to help because all of white California is there to save them. And when I get home, my nose bleeds hot onto a wind burned upper lip dripping to the floor. And I'd like to think that means something like a punishment for an immoral act. And maybe in the next life, I'll care more and suffer less. Um, that, that's the first one. And then I read this other poem. Um, this is just, this next poem I'm gonna read is called uh, Exposure Therapy. And I, I've read this another time, but it's something I'm working on and, you know, uh, it's something that I'm, I'm trying to get somewhere, uh, something I'm trying to, to work on. And uh, yeah, here it goes. Uh, it's called Exposure Therapy. Is it cruel to let a baby squirrel suffer after it falls from a redwood? Or is it more cruel to bash it once with a shovel and throw it into the green trash can? 90s rock bands dared the world to end. Maybe it is, or maybe it is the unending cycle of ends where the mode is changed, not the end result. And the children sing, the rains came down and the floods came up and the moon is red from ash. Fire is the next promise. Can we handle it? I can't handle watching something die. A white dude in camouflage climbs to the top of a freeway overpass and sits leisurely waiting to jump. And by the time I turn around, he does, only to catch himself at the last minute. He climbs back over into the arms of a waiting police officer, something I don't understand. Sometimes the human need is to be touched. A baby squirrel's cry sounds like a dog's chew toy that is compressed and squeezed over and over. I am versed in Christianity. I know the BB gun that kills crows or the healed shovel that cuts the heads off snakes or the hand that pulls the adrenal innards from screaming rabbits. I know researchers argue that we are weaker as a society because we know not the violence. A Pentecostal church deacon tells me that our military is weak because we don't fight enough. I wonder how cold we have become as a nation. Sometimes I cry for the lost dead. I cry for a yelping squirrel. And still, in both instances, I remain apathetic. I have ignored the cries of young children in cages, of old farm workers whose heads were sprayed with the same melathion that I bought to rid my, rid my yard of meat bees. These same farm workers work without complaint in raining ash and unforgiving sun. And my father cries in prayer because he wants me to go to church with him at his new startup. I've ignored this too for months. Is apathy a symptom of our cronyistic system? Do I feel that we can't help but lose anymore? Have I given up? I love the ballads about people power, but the Republicans keep trying to play rage against the machine at their asinine rallies. I love the Tower of Babel in the Bible and the scope of human ingenuity, because when we come together with the common goal, even God says he can't stop us. Maybe the myth is there, so we don't. I left a squirrel to die in my Asheville yard. I need to do more for God. Uh, thank, thank you all. Thank you so much, JJ. Um, and now we have uh, Chevas Vandel. Chevas is a Central Valley creative writer currently working on his uh, episodic short story, Blood and Bruises, the Laureate Lab offers him artistic refuge. Uh, take it away, Chevy.
a mute. Hey, can everyone hear me now? Sweet. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, uh, that's going to be a tough act to follow, but I'll try. Um, this next piece of writing, it's an excerpt from the third episode of my short story. I was a disembodied prism of color. I didn't even know if in this form I had eyes, but once I reached the river, I had a clear reflection of myself in the water. I was bright and electric and could feel the warmth emanating from my core. Colors pulled their way throughout my surface. I couldn't tell if they were fighting or dancing, but the constant movement of pigments gave me determination. I felt clear and precise. There was no flesh, bone, or meat to weigh me to the earth. I felt unshackled and set aflame. So many years on earth I had spent with my physical form, and now here I existed in a state that felt truer than the shell I had departed from. It wasn't ecstasy. It wasn't an addictive high. The feeling did not feel temporary, so I worried not if it would leave. I felt no ego, only heart. I continued to bask in my oneness and looked into the river and smelled the dreamy fall air and drunk the moment in as if it were the freshest water to ever be had. I realized that once I had dived into myself, I was no longer human, but felt more alive now than I had ever. I was still visible to the outside world. And although I was happy with my new form, I hadn't considered how others around me would react. Am I even capable of human speech anymore? If I tried to communicate to someone, would they even understand? The urge to express myself took over and I could feel movement swell throughout what I would loosely describe as my new body. Every atom was dancing and with purpose. There were pieces of me that lifted themselves up while others depressed themselves downward. Each speck of my existence shined brightly and then cooled and then shone again. Four corners expanded into 16, and then that 16 had its own offspring. Looking into my reflection in the river, I saw my colors begin to stabilize. The fantasia of color and light was bringing itself into a white hot ball. Then I heard it, my voice, or I think you can call it a voice. It was a single sustained note that vibrated through the trees and into the ground and beyond space. Then a higher angelic voice harmonized with it. Then a lower earthy voice filled in the bottom. Everything was still in the forest and even the river appeared to listen to my song. I felt heard. I felt recognized on a cosmic level. I felt present. I felt alive and real. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Next, we have uh, Pa Sanchez. Pa um, graduated from Fresno State with an MFA in 2018. His poems can be found in Vagabonds, Anthology of the Mad Ones, 521 Magazine, and the Pacific Review. Currently, he teaches at Fresno City College. Go, go ahead, Pa. Thank you, Graciela. I want to thank everyone who took time out of their day to join us tonight for poetry and to join us for um, this book catching with uh, Juan Felipe Pereira and Anthony Cody. Thank you. I want to thank them for um, asking us to uh, share their space with them tonight. Um, I also want to extend my thanks to Fresno State, to QUA, to the Laureate Lab for all the work they do also. I have two poems I'm going to read with you tonight. The first one is about my grandfather. It's called El Bravo and his shoeshine box. I already mentioned the army uniform photos. At 17, in the middle of what his ancestors would call the good life, he never questioned his call to fight in that war. Even after all the books, his view from any pier or park bench was, it's all right, it's all right. Let that poor boy pray that flying mortar only take the calf from one of the best legs that ever danced in Venice, California. The day he was sent to school, his father told him to make a box out of wood, the wood in the back where the chickens stay. Use that box to carry a brush, some shine, and a towel. Told him go to the corner and ask to shine men's shoes. If he was lucky, pay was a nickel or a dime. Mostly pennies were earned, as it is sometimes. Those days arriving at school two hours late with some lessons already taught, his still left to learn 
like how a grenade blast becomes the handle for living with a shiny box just above your eyes, another on your shoulder, this world, another box put together without nail, hammer, or saw, clay-like fragments of shine. Second poem I'm going to read for you guys is called Sun Induced Dark Age or La Chinga. Welcome to La Chinga. You heard me right. Not welcome to the machine or welcome to the jungle. Welcome to La Chinga. That's how we say it in this family. In this family, that's how we say shelter, struggle, and need. Welcome to tomorrow's darkness today. The climate changes lots of ways. You said that just the other day. That's why. Welcome to La Chinga. Welcome to end it all. Welcome to all the thank yous never heard above the crowded La Chinga. Keep your Yorona, your Chupacabra, your Bigfoot Loch Ness abominable dinosaur. That ching La Chinga is that crown of fire in the sky, once visible from the bottom of an ocean. Watch it fall from star to shrug in just one day. La Chinga, stars have, written, have eaten themselves before. La Chinga, we couldn't keep La Chinga for ourselves. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. <laughs> so next we have uh, Mariah Bash. Mariah is a poet from Fresno whose poems can be found in Cos Cosmonauts Avenue, Glass Poetry, Poets.org, and elsewhere. The Laureate Lab helps her to reimagine poetry's possibilities. Go ahead, Mariah. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here. I I'm so excited and honored to be part of this. Um, the Laureate Lab and Juan Felipe and Anthony really changed my whole MFA experience and now we're here. Um, so it's really awesome to celebrate. And with all of you, thanks for all being here. Um, I have a few poems to share with you. This first one is called Memory Number Eight. Memory Number Eight. My sister, fresh born, and someone guides my hand with care. I know it's him. This is how memory is formed. Decide what you want and it germinates. A truth. My grandfather's hand, his unthinned skin, the watch face remains clear in mind. Another. My sister's new life in my arms. Another. None of this really comes to me. I lose truth every day. It wilts in windows. A different voice announces its own version, tangled into my lying. Um, this next poem is called Q&A. What's a healing room supposed to look like? Is that some place I can go? The air got thinner up there, but I walked anyway. The room got smaller as my head pressed into itself. Am I in the healing room yet? If it's a religious thing, I won't get in, but I'll get inside, through doors or windows or inside, they are plush leather couches and framed prints of clouds, but they're animated fake. All the couches are missing their cushions. Is this healing yet? I have my guilt and cushion it. They ask, shouldn't I call myself an atheist? But I try calling some kind of God, maybe not one, maybe several, or maybe one with several heads, to call God something. I something my way into the healing room. Um, this next one is called Double Sonnet Suspended. We wake in a timeless space and rain lights the room. Neither of us knows who began the rediscovery of our bodies as we come into our own waking. Here, we've woken into the same dream. Can't hear the rain, but know it. Can't see your face, but know the perennial of this room. The small of my hand against sternum to confirm its beat in this tenuous reel. I build my thoughts beyond this room, and now they all cycle to you. Oh, how I think of what could happen before these bulbs light. See a knife to my neck, or faceless trouble behind the couch. See, I wear two faces from my ears to ask you to look between them and at my own. 
how my body works to empty and sleep and forgets itself overnight, how you do not forget me overnight. The windows are clear, but we don't look out. I dreamt about you while next to you. The confession comes days later. To create a world together, it takes seven consecutive REM cycles, 12 interrupted. Share these illusions. Build ecliptic scenes we can't confront wide-eyed. Send me your wavelengths, your desired life. If you ask what I remember, I will know you are incapable of witness. And then I have one more for you tonight. Um, this one's a love poem. Um, my girlfriend's out there in cyberspace, so this one's for that. It's called Riverbank. My hands peach pit the river. Up from water spring my hands, your fruit, a letter's start. Dearest, water suggests, but I start elsewhere, asking, how do you hear me now when recalling my voice? From this place, I hear us softer, and there is so little to explain both my never leaving and coming to this edge. I include two photos, one at a distance, a person alone in curved wheat. The second, another separating stalks to reach them. I place them in descending order. You and the frame to find me here, then gone. Apparitioned, then wished. A peach tree sprouts, displacing fish, all asking where to send your letter as fruit floods the bank, your thumbprint in each. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, Mariah. Now we have uh, Gao Yang Bang. Gao is a, is a poet raised without a stable home throughout the Central Valley. She examines her identity as a Hmong American, right, American without roots. The Laureate Lab is her second home where she spends most of the time. Thank you, Gao. All right, hello everyone. I also have a few poems to share. Uh, this first poem is called Two Sides of the River, Above and Beneath. It is a poem I wrote for a poet friend who passed this early spring. Uh, he, his name is Paul. You ascend above the river, the wounded gibbon mourns, a waning crescent lingers, yet only the mountains shake with grief, their cold sighs fogging your rootless jungle home. Flowers that bloom during the day hide their new colors, waiting to see years from now. The dragons of the Mekong River that spared you once, let your embrace are drowned one last time. I burn my song for you, ember echoes, as I whisper my deepest thunder, melodies fall into whistles. I sang your written folk songs, using the lost tones to follow you on your journey. Now two voices swaddle memory of loss. Uh, this next poem doesn't have a title, um, so I will start now. Stiff fingers, stretching. The ghost stands over the mountains, stares at the lights, and the young lady turning out her eyes, pours clear ink to soak the blackened mask. Dip there, here, splash of darkness, sink into saturation. Adding wrinkles of hue, no matter how the past tries to catch up, it never catches the fruit. It never reaches the fruit because the branches sit with the stars. Uh, this last one is called My Will. And uh, just to provide a little bit of context for this, um, a king is a wooden mong instrument and it is used to guide the dead. Do not sacrifice an animal to give me a spirit guide. I will not understand the road that the drums and ring lay before me. Not recognizing my face as ancestors. Play for me sounds of poetry, an orchestra of friends, until the burning incense finishes bowing. That way, my true love will not have to stay for days worshiping my dead body. Overlooking, protecting, protecting, cradling, empty heartache. Instead, reciting gentle words hidden on a cloudy day. Chanting, singing, 
as I stand aside listening to them as others have listened to me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gal. Okay, um, next we have Javier Lopez. Uh, Javier Lopez is a Lincoln Foods icebox, icebox worker turned poet. His haze was finally removed when he stepped into the lorry lab, and all that was left was the cosmos ma magic and the squatches. Go ahead, Javier. Hi guys, can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so actually I wanted to start, um, before I read my piece, I actually just have one poem that I'm going to read uh, today, but I wanted to start out my time with an answer of a interview question done with uh, Juan Felipe Herrera. Um, with uh, or through the Poets and Writers interview about his new book. Uh, it was done on the 22nd, I believe. Uh, it's 10 questions for, for Juan Felipe Herrera. And the last question um, really struck me this past week. And I thought um, I'd read it to everybody because to me, it really sounded um, like a poem in disguise. Um, but I think uh, it's, it's a very useful answer to, uh, to remind us why we do the work as writers, as, as poets, as artists. Um, and the question is, so what's the best piece of writing advice you've ever heard? Um, and Juan Felipe immediately answers, Ay que sabe luchar. Um, something his mother would always say. You have to know how to struggle, fight, survive, she made it through the Mexican Revolution and its aftermath, all the way through the migrant farm working fields to San Francisco. Remember, it is art. If you are not enjoying jotting words on scraps of paper, tapping jazz-like onto the keyboard, noticing tiny realities appear out of the blank universe, the breath of it all, the bounce into the world, the odd angled something talking, the various stops, pauses, silences, emergent moments, revelations, the gripes, the stubborn figure you've become, the ecstatic face you generate when you are done, the funky cohort you apparently have joined <clears throat> as you continue, the voices you throw out when you read your work, the variety of printed out sheet stacks on your desk, this odd plankton you have become swishing toward the oily surface of brilliance at the very top edge of the murky waters. Then maybe you've got to loosen up or move on to fiction or a real job. How about painting? And uh, yeah, that, that was the answer. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure if anybody else feels anything from that particular answer, but uh, that one really put me on my back end this week. Um, and it really pushed me to want to read um, the poem that I think set apart my, my work in the MFA program and what I really wanted to write about. Um, and there's, there's a quote also in my head that seems to always be reverberating and then like circling around um, in very much the same regard as Juan Felipe Herrera's Ay que sabe luchar. Um, there was something that my father had told me about four to five years ago before I had really kind of dove into the, my undergrad work in English and lit and poetry. Um, and when I began to take poetry and, and, and write poetry seriously, he said, he said these words to me, he said, I would rather not have my family in your poetry, son. Um, and that's what really pushed me to give myself a voice in a, in a place where I thought I already had a voice, but don't necessarily at the end of the day do. Um, so now I have to enter that space. And the poem 
itself in my thesis is uh, it's about eight or nine sections long. Um, all of them devoted to Sorry about that. Oh, there we go. <clears throat> All of them devoted to kind of a letter or a poem directly to the person that I'm writing to. Um, so if I can share that. Okay, never mind. There we go. Perfect. So I'd rather not have my poetry, my family in your poetry, son. Dad. How about we call this new land together? You are proud, I get it. You do know who you were talking to, right? Let me rephrase. You do know how the mountain sides talk to trees. Call me unqualified to be an accountant just because I didn't travel across a border to find life. That I can thank you for. And all along here, we are at odds. It must be the low level iron in our blood. Yes, our blood. Misaligned oak, under charred wonder of lifeless breathing, misdevoted sons of birches cursed by knowledge of demons hunting our aunts and uncles' air. And I am okay with that, even if you are not. I am okay with it, and I am still here. Even if you want to die alone, yes, you remind me almost every time we get a chance to talk about time. It ends with you dying alone. And I am still here eradicated brown skin, and I am still here, embraced by the dead of my ancestors, and I am still here in this tired but still moving maintain of a broken tongued body mirroring, mirroring you, and I am still here talking along the underscore of Nana's brown charred spoon and I am still here talking along broken singing lungs of Tata's chapped lips, and I am still here talking as I light this cast iron on the stove of my upstairs apartment without a balcony, and I am still talking to turn masa and oil and salt and pepper and love and love and love, and love, and love, into love, and do you know why? Well, for one, I am your son. You just couldn't see it when you said those words. Let me set the record about as flat panned as I can get it to burn into place. Just as the one who taught me to get the tortillas perfect for dinner, or Tata would be angry, Take a guess at who that was, Pops. Take a guess at who that was. Who was the one who gave me my real broken tongue all those years? You taught wisdom to your students at work while your son struggled to speak to his grandparents. Well, Dad, I learned not by phonetic practice, not nor, nor forced into your classroom, no, but by cast iron. The wisdom of cast iron finger laced fire char onto skin like a child warrior of flame. See, si, ponle un poquito más de masa porque ne necesita levanta con el sol de fuego del tiempo que no vivo yo, dad. Vivo yo, dad. Yo vivo, dad. I am alive. Thank you. Thank you so much, Javi. Thank you. Okay, next we have um, Tony Vane. 
Tony is both a poet and a break dancer. The Laureate Lab is a studio of both visual words and visual movements for him. Go ahead, Tony. Hey everyone, uh, Tony here. I assume the mic is working and that it sounds great. Okay, so uh, I just wanna say thanks to everyone who showed up because honestly, we are in uncharted territory for all of this online business. Just wanna give props to the people working in the background because you probably had to hustle to figure all this out and get it done smoothly. So big props to you. And it is just such an honor to be here reading with my fellow labbers and to be also be reading alongside like Juan Felipe and Anthony Cody, who are two legendary forces, not even at their prime yet. And just, just I just want to like to say something for the record, because Anthony and I were texting each other earlier today. And the, it was on the subject of poetry. Surprise, surprise. And Anthony said, the object of the poem is not to know, but to learn more than you did before it started. And I'm like, I have waited for this. He made an off the cuff, one sentence, philosophy of poetry, like he breathes and sleeps in poetry. And honestly, I think he does. I sadly can only write love poems and fun poems. And I'm gonna read two for tonight. The first one is a love poem to Mireda Barraza Martinez, my professor. I had her that faithful semester when she passed away. And the more I dwell on it as the years pass, the more I realize that I loved her as human beings should love each other. And that my younger self did not yet understand that abstract nuance of love. And so the title is Mia, Muse of Power. What is poetry? You asked before silently moving on. I have my answer now. It took fresh blood on old scars to find. It is a sword that cannot be drawn with an inscription on its scabbard. There is no Lord worth serving, no Lord worth dying for. I solved the riddle to open the blade. In the realm of gods and demons, a burdened heart has more value than existence. Poetry is the migration of dragons that inspired my footwork in battle. Gods and goddesses who gave their golden era to us. The spark of immortality blessed me with flight and my newfound flame is cooled by the gift they left behind. Their battlefields, our mountains, their gardens, our force, their fires, our stars, their hearts, our sun and moon, their blood and tears, our lakes and rivers, their sighs, our winds forever was used for expression. The note left in my heart's chamber still glows with traces of your soul. Reincarnation purges soul into stardust. The enlightened one out of kindness or cruelty lets me keep the weighted cross on my chest. Now, my humbled heart is ready to let go, opens the cage filled with the grace that is your voice. No person should have the power to dictate who stays and who gets deported. No person should have the power to dictate where a person's home is. And the second poem is based on a true story. This is the fun poem. Uh, it involves Juan Felipe, a Daryl storage, a truck, and labbers who were just really kind of hanging around and had nothing to do that day. Okay, and I called it Cilantro Man's Harvest Festival. In the back of Juan Felipe's truck, JJ says, I feel like I'm going farming again. Masks and gloves on, we begin to put our backs into the job, hauling and stacking the box collections. Dusts of history find their way into our bloodstreams. Autographs and blurbs rise from, rise from their sleep to dance to echoes of harmonicas and mariachis. Our voice our voices communicate celebration, sing the lyrics of knowledge we had pride from guardian gates and shadow shrouds. Under the afternoon heat, we swing, we hummingbird from one past to another, seeing through time. Excavation of scripted vegetables, inked fruits, visual words, fossils to take home. Each of us take a pile of books, seeds to plant in our future garden. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we have Anthony Cody. 
Anthony was raised off a highway off-ramp in Southeast Fresno. This allows you to prepare for a lot of scenarios. Being long-listed for the National Book Award for his debut collection, Borderland Apocrypha, is not one of them. He is working on ascending into a minotaur of fluxes. He comes to the lab to make a living Fresno poem with labors and nourish the third eye imagination. Go ahead, Anthony. Thank you. Before I begin, I just want to acknowledge that tonight I'm reading on the traditional lands of the Yokut and Mono people. I pay my respect to the native elders, both the past and the present, and to this land that we are all on. May each of us present continue to honor the true stewards of these lands and the lands themselves. You know, before I start talking, I just also want to just give a shout out for Graciela for hosting all the, the cats of the Laureate Lab tonight and trying to hurt us all smoothly and nicely and eloquently the entire time as we pour our hearts out. Um, a little bit about her, she's far too, uh, not her own hype person, but she just started up the Dos Palos Book Loan to help get books out there to the hands of readers in West Fresno County that look like us. Hit her up and find out how you can help. I want to thank Jefferson. I want to thank Gia. I want to thank Mariah, Gracie, and all of Qua for helping put on the event. I'm just really grateful to sit here and read with all of you in this virtual world during these really horrible times. So we have to celebrate the little what we can when we can for as long as we can. I'm excited to hear Juan Felipe. I don't think I've ever actually officially read with him. I don't think many of us have ever officially read with him. So this is kind of exciting, super exciting. Um, you know, um, before kind of diving into reading, one of the reasons why we are here today, I want to say that all of the proceeds the donations and the tickets uh, go to the Mireida Barraza Martinez Social Justice Writing Scholarship. Um, Mia passed away in November 2016, and if not for that, she'd be reading with us today. She was a poet with deep love for community collaboration and subverting all the institutions that continue to limit us. The Laureate Lab is as much a gift of her own imagination as it is for all of us here today. I was debating whether I was going to read a poem from her, but Tony, we're going to do it. So I have a poem here from her thesis called uh, My Furniture Reminds Me of Movimiento, and this is by Mia Barata Martinez. All of the furniture in my room is staring at me. I haven't moved it in over three years, and it's about to start up a petition against stagnation. They're no longer inspired by the Pussy Power poster or the Jaguar screen print. Even the Virgen de Guadalupe candle lost its luster under a veil of dust. The couch groans now when I sit on the same spot. It pushes me off. I bang my elbow on the coffee table and the carpet burns my knee. Okay, okay, I say, and begin to collect what the walls have dropped in protest. I help the couches move around. The plants begin to wave and books flap their covers. Movement, everyone sings. Remember movement. So that's a poem from her. So I'm gonna dive into uh, my collection. Um, and some of these poems I'm gonna share tonight are um, are a little heavy on the heavier side because they deal with um, lynchings and specifically lynchings of the Southwest after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. And I just wanted to give you that and I will dive in and kind of, I'll share screen on some of the poems and then others I won't. And just so you can stare at me while I try to work through this. <clears throat> So I'm going to read the opening uh, poem from the collection, um, which is inspired by true events, unfortunately. Standing in line to take a passport photo, an old white man looks at me and claims I am running. 
standing here because my grandpa ran away from home to sell perfume in Ozocalo at nine. In line, I am a lot of things. And since I am a lot of things, I am everything he cannot imagine. A passport photo asks me to two by two myself and capture what I am in neutral. And I recall I have yet to see the chambers of my heart turn tusk. An old white man is not Gil Scott Heron saying, because I always feel like running, not away, because there is no such place. It's not how you pronounce exile or escapar. Looks at me how Teddy Roosevelt died coveting a white buffalo. Claims, I am afraid. No, I am a wall. No, I am a mirror. I am still, so still. <clears throat> and if you notice, there are um, sort of like footnotes. These poems cascade from one another. So the title of the next poem is actually related to um, the fourth stand, the fourth section, an old white man. And this is the title of that one. An old white man is not Gil Scott Heron saying, because I always feel like running, not away because there is no such place is not how you pronounce exile or escapar. An old white man is now my father, was once his father. And one day a stranger may assume I am. Gil Scott Heron dies on the same day astronauts aboard Endeavour walk on what is perceived the final walk in space by NASA and was born 97 years to the day Carlos Esclava was lynched for theft in Mullicumney Hill, California before a crowd of approximately a thousand. I always feel like running, not away, because there is no such place. In the night, the air is what I find in a dream when I reach for the hand of a friend. All that remains is a round patch of scar at the end of his right arm. He does not skip a beat and places the limb in my palm and I cradle it. He says, it has been a long time since we touched. This is true. I do not pull away, want to. He laughs pulls away into the handstand with his good arm, and a spider appears. Said it is a frontera window. He crawls through, stands, waves goodbye. Pronounce ex ex exile, like exhale, like missile, like monkey, like key, like a door. There must be opened, and while a clave exists, you cannot make it from your mouth. Escapar is not a choice, but the shape of a hand carving itself moonlight. Okay, I'm going to stop the share. I'm going to let you see me drink a little bit of water. I'm grateful for you all being here tonight. I see all the love for everyone, and I'm grateful to share in this space. The next poem is actually it has a op-ed from the uh, from from a valley newspaper as the epigraph and i'll read that too <clears throat> and one of the things that i encountered in in my research is that the poems not only encapsulate 1848 and to like the 1900 but as we all are too far too too well aware that the crimes against brown and black people continue to happen to this very day and unfortunately, these epigraphs sound far too real like Facebook posts that you might see if we just logged on right now. Nopales, a Mexican lynching, number 39. Mexicans have no business in this country. I don't believe in them. The white were made to be, the, the men were made to be shot at and the women were made for our purposes. I'm a white man, I am. A Mexican is pretty near black. I hate all Mexicans. April 6th, 1850, Stockton Times op-ed. A Nepal could be weeping, but who examines las espinas closely as the blossoms? A fire quema todo, pero salva los que cubren la llama. A Nepal could be quiet, 
but who plunges each thorn into the drum and swallows? The rust no es una cortina para parar el torrente. A nopal could be asleep, but who kicks the hibernating until sunrise shows they are countless. The drought is rooted in birth. Es una paciencia de ríos. <clears throat> this next poem is actually um, documenting the first documented lynching in California following the treaty, um, which happened up north in Downeyville, California. And it's titled uh, La Sirena Mexican Lynching after the hanging death of Josefa Segovia, Downeyville, California, July 5th, 1851. Guilt is not guilty, is not free, is not noose, is not jury, is not self, is not a defense, is not judge, is not verdict, is not appeal, is not the way which a minor pans and pans and pans and pans and pans until a fleck appears. Eventually, something must be found. Eventually, someone must let the blade taste, make, tear a seam. A seam is uncooked is the point in which a man spills red from the white heat glowing and heaving until she stops him, until the town claims siren, claims capital. Josefa is not Juana, is not Juanita, is not the assembled bridge of independence atop the Yuba River, now court, now kangaroo, now noose and song, left to walk through, left to float above, left to the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and how all men are created equal until a border born and there's money to be made until man is not labor, is not woman, is not Mexican, is not white, is not the moment a town stops to watch a person face the crowd and wrap a rope around their own neck, claims leap. In the air, flight is real, is probable, is the moment of weightlessness before the snap, before the eyes decide to untangle the dark, the other, the unknown, before the river parts and she kicks and kicks below until they say she is consumed, until they accept silences, until she dives with a deep breath of water and people accept her body thrashes beneath surface. But this is not a burial. This is a defiance, a kicking, singing, kicking, singing chant. Okay, let get through this. I'm going to do two more poems before I hand it off to Juan Felipe. <clears throat> this is um, a poem that has an epigraph from 2018. El Arfa, a Mexican lynching number 53. The office of the sheriff is a critical part of the Anglo-American heritage of law enforcement. We must never erode this historic office. Jeff Sessions, former U.S. Attorney General, February 12, 2018, to the National Sheriff's Association. One, the inheritance of the air is never a dandelion dispersal, scattershot, floating beyond fences, growing elsewhere. Two, the inheritance of the elsewhere is a cave of collapse. Three, the cave of collapse is work. Four, the work is never inheritance of the heirs, the heirs' heir, as well as the heirs' heirs' heir. Five, the inheritance of repetition is a soundless gavel buried in a shallow grave. Six, the shallow grave is the redness of the bouquet of flora selects. Seven, the bouquet is, a le is leaning into the quiet of a funeral. Eight, the quiet of a funeral is the Americas. Nine, the Americas is a platform built by the settlers, sheriffs, and miners for the lynching of the other. Ten, the lynching is a vigilance committee of NAFTA, Operation Wetback Maquiladoras, ICE, Silences, and Agricultural Prison Industrial Complex, Congressman of the United States Presidents. Eleven, the silence is the gerrymandering of census data. Twelve, the census data is learning about the word incarceration through the storytelling project played on public radio. Thirteen, the incarceration is an obligo of shirts and a forest of screams. Fourteen, the obligo is a feeding again and never hungry. Fifteen, the feeding is a church of excommunications inside a cage of teeth. Sixteen, the cage of teeth is elected in the office. Seventeen, the elected are voting to eliminate whatever and everything. Eighteen, the voting are no longer asking permission. Nineteen, permission is trafficking. Twenty, the trafficking is now asked to self-report. 21, the self-report self is now asked to fill out a binary form online in ink. 22, the binary is seeking a fourth option during the election. 23, the election is a wall. 24, the wall is a type of silence. 25, the silence is a type of America. 26, the type of America is in the arrest. 27, the arrest is defined as a cessation or stoppage of motion. 
28, the cessation or stoppage of motion is the fabric veiling the artifice. 29, the fabric veiling the artifice is a factory of harps. 30, the factory of harps is a maker of a stringless harp. 31, the stringless harp is the mute progeny. 32, the mute progeny is now the inheritance of the air. Okay, water break, definitely a water break. I just wanna say again, thank you all who have made it here virtually. I'm really grateful and overwhelmed to just be here with all of you. Um, the world is literally and figuratively on fire. I don't think poetry is gonna save us, but I think it's gonna to start to allow us to reimagine the universe that heals and doesn't harm, that invites us instead of omits people, that nourishes and doesn't reduce. And maybe, hopefully, starts a revolution. This is my final poem, uh, the title poem, Borderland Apocrypha. If your father tells you and your teacher tells you and the pastor at your churches, at your family's church tells you to perceive breath for existing, heart for source, grave as final, voice as kingdom, the shaking as the escape of the earth's heat. You believe the repetition, but don't. Believe that earthquakes are fed by the buried, shoulders leaning in and sinewed by the unseen, combative to covert. Recall that beneath you, nothing is still. Recall that beneath you are the others. No, there is no such thing as living. Living is a birth to control you, to fear no longer being present, to fear this, whatever your this is can leave you. The night's knuckle on your door is not consent, but a decay of the ego unheard. A nearness unknown until an apnea arrives, tearing you from bed for the noose, the blade, the bullet, the fingers forcing the larynx. You were never living. Your father would tell you, the priest and prophet and the succulent on the windowsill will not stop you and say, you are not living. You are present. Some tomorrow there'll be no sunrise. None will say, where is, where is, where is? They will believe you are no longer. Your blood will mourn. The other will gather to publicly demonstrate life is proprietary. Do not listen. Join the present at the tectonic and continue to be. Push. Press your ear against the mantle to hear the sound of the pavement's rupture. Push. The city will not sleep push. The flora, fauna, stone, nod. You have always been present. Push. A valley is quiet whether cradling or calling. Push. The television and the paper will say the fault is active. Push. The scientists will diagram the earth halved and demonstrate why nothing remains static. Push. The present remain here. Push here, push here, push, leave, return, you exist, push. You are present, push. Swallow them into quiet. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Anthony. Okay, last we have um, Juan Felipe Herrera. Um, he is a Molcajete handmade salsa specialist from Taylor Days Through the Valley, attended ancient theaters in the 50s when 10 years old as a sport, lasted 15 seconds as a boxer at the Mission Branch Boys Club in San Francisco in 1956. On occasion, a San Diego Mission beach body surfer, maybe, wave, maybe one wave out of hundreds, he is most inspired by the new generation of laureate labor poets. Thank you. Are we, uh, am I on? <laughs> uh, you know, well, thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody. I, I really want to thank all the labors, everyone that read in Graciela, 
and everyone that has put this uh, program together and all of you and your familias at this time and uh, Jefferson, you know, the whole, the whole family, it's really a family. I'm feeling really good about everyone. And, uh, such beautiful and tender voices. I think that's what I felt every, you know, all the tender voices and such, uh, such, uh, you know, beautiful visions and, and uh, enlightenments. Every poem had so many enlightenments, don't you think? Every poem had so many discoveries and so many journeys, you know, into time, space, relationships, uh, history, uh, language, words, uh, most of all, the, that beautiful melody from the heart. Did, didn't you hear that? That beautiful melody from the heart. Uh, you know, what really, a, what really is a voice? You know, our voice, what is really, our, what's our voice when it's free, when it's based in the heart and it comes out, and the mind when it expands and just casts out so many beautiful beams of light. And I think tonight, tonight, uh, this afternoon, uh, everyone, everyone did that. Everyone did that. It was like a circle of enlightened, um, tender, loving, uh, caring human beings. Uh, we use the word poets, uh, and that's fine too. And poetry, and that's fine too. But it was just a beautiful conversation where you open up a, a treasure box, or you finally get to the, the spring, and the water is, or the fountain and the water is just beautiful turquoise water, and it refreshes you, and you, you clean the water from your face, and you finally see the sky, and you finally see the earth, and you see yourself. <laughs> That's what it was for me, this reading tonight. It's so rare, so rare to have uh, these poets and to have their words uh, throughout, you know, throughout our day. So let's carry their words everywhere we go. Such beautiful findings and journeys and discoveries. So I'm so happy. And, you know, the, uh, Graciela Jefferson, I'm so happy for them because they, they, gave, they gave us their heart also. So every, every poet was just so beautiful. And, and I want to be in that beauty all the time. And it is here all the time. And it just takes this amazing group to bring it to us. So let's give them a super, super big applause from our heart. And, you know, our mind, you know, I think our minds have changed, right? Our minds have changed. I think my mind was a little square when I first got here. And I think my mind finally found a, a beautiful heart shape. And so deep, so deep, you guys. God, you know, I don't have to go to math, take a physics class. <laughs> it's just amazing. And demons and dragons and time and erasure and that, that incredible treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and the lynchings. You know, that's all, in a way, that feels new, doesn't it? Even though we feel it, we don't read about it. You know, it's, it's not public. All this that was said tonight is not public, you know? Everything that was said tonight should be on giant buildings. Big old, the biggest building in Fresno, the valley. All these pieces should be there. Um, and voices, we should hear these voices, your voices. That's how I feel. Uh, well, thank you once again. Every day we get more illegal. Um, I was feeling that, you know, I was feeling that. I think we all feel that. And now it's really hilarious. You know, every day there's a new set of statements that um, they don't really make any sense. You know, um, you know everything that's in the media and the votes. And so I'm glad we have the labbers and Jefferson and Graciela. I'm very inspired. I remember meeting Andres Montoya, having Andres Montoya, when he came to school, uh, I started to teach that same year, 1990. And uh, Daniel Chacon and the beginning of Qua was so, such a beautiful moment. And how, what a great, uh, great poets they both became. Uh, so, so here, here's the here's the book. You know, it was a kind, it's a kind of book, or uh, I just wanted to say it. You know, I just wanted to say it. I spent so many years playing with language and enjoying playing with language, and I still do. And you know, going to the right, going to the left, going under, going over, just just having the greatest time in the world with language. Uh, maybe it's because I I really didn't say anything for so many years. Felt pushed back until I finally, exp I finally exploded uh, and it was language, it was poetry. 
So let's, I'm going to read, uh, don't push the button. I keep on feeling <laughs> that there's a button that someone wants to push, and it's a very big button. Um, and it has to do with war and uh, what can happen. And I guess our lives right now, everything's on the, on the edge, on the edge. And that edge is that button, that edge. We want to stay in harmony and unity, but there's this edge where it could all fall apart. Just don't understand why so many, why so many want you to push the button. Don't push it. Please don't push it. You're making me nervous. I'm slashing toward nowhere. Art is not enough. Performance is not enough. Something is missing. Don't push it to fill the vacuum. It is something that has not been solved before. It is that simple. You must find that, achieve that. It is not too late. The button, of course, is not the answer. Of course, it provides an ounce or two of arousal, similar to the walls of patrols, similar to the $30 billion aircraft carrier you just set out into the metal oceans. Do not push it. I am nervous. Something is off kilter. It is beyond words, beyond poetry, beyond Milton or Sappho. It is beyond Pass and Ko Un. It is beyond all the African drummers. It is closer to the ashes of South Sudan and the green skulls of a Mexican state I cannot mention. And the massacres. The massacres. So many massacres in plain sight. Do not push it. We will fall, leaves or snow, it is that simple. We will not have to wait for three billion more years to perish as the solar orb dissolves and cuts the forces that hold us. Do not push it. Do not listen to the war provosts beside you. Come here where we all sit in this annex between walls of a nondescript house where we shudder, where we write, and string the guitar, the fervent bones we spin on the floor. Do not push. Uh, it's so good to be with the labbers in the lab. Uh, we, we just literally we play, you know, we play, and and it's good to play with art in ourselves and our voices and as a group, as a group not solitary world as right as writers uh, which is okay but we got to work together now from this day on or from yesterday on we got to really really come together now so in between the book I put these uh, small items right there four lines five lines and I call them address book for the firefly on the road north. An address book, very small address book for the firefly on the road north. My mother used to have a little tiny, tiny address, a little address book. And she, she used it as her journal. And I never read it until just a couple of years ago. And it's, it's brutal, it's brutal. Uh, she speaks of the days when we didn't have any money at all. And it was her birthday one time, and we were penniless. And she writes that, you know, it's my birthday, and my son and don't have anything. So that's that little address book. It's really uh, emotional to read. So this is the address book for the Firefly on the Road North. And it says, we are merrily seekers, wanderers, moving alongside the mountains. And in a sense, this book is uh, dedicated to all our familias, one way or another, migrating, migrated, and the migrantes of the last two, three years, all of them, all of us, and the brutality that they suffered. And I was, I was just, I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't hold back anymore. So that's where this book comes from. Touch the earth. Touch the earth once again. 
this is what we do. This is what the cotton truck driver does. This is what the tobacco leaf roller does. This is what the washerwoman and the laundry worker does. This is what the grape and artichoke worker does. Not to mention the cucumber workers, not to mention the spinach and the beet workers, not to mention the poultry woman workers, not to mention the packing house workers and the winery workers and the lettuce and broccoli and peach and apricot and squash and apple and that almost magical watermelon and the speckled melon and the honeydew, the workers, this is what they do. Notice how they bend in the fires no one sees. Notice their ecstatic colors and their knotted shirts. Notice where they cash their tiny and wrinkled checks and pay stubs. Then walk away and walk out they do, and do stall for a moment they do, underneath a colossal tree with its condor wings, shedding solace for a second or two. Notice how they touch the earth for you. So it is good to, to look in and to look out. I think I, I think I did both, but most of the time I'm looking out, uh, being concerned and wanting to scream. And I guess these poems turn into, the slow screams turn into these poems. It's very rare that I write a book that kind of, is, every poem connects with the other poem. It's uh, kind of new for me. Every day we get more illegal. So this is where that the title comes. And in this poem, I wanted to say, you know, positive things and I wanted to say the real things. We all have the dream of what life should be like. And it's good to write that dream, but it's also good to write what we don't want to look at sometimes and we put them together and it turns into reality. Every day we get more illegal, yet the peach tree still rises and falls with fruit and without. Birds eat it, the sparrows fight. Our desert burns with trash and drug. It also breathes and sprouts, vines and maguey. Laws pass, laws with scientific walls, detention cells, husband with the son, the wife and the daughter who married a citizen. They stay behind, broken, slashed, half shadows, in the apartments to deal out the day. And the puzzles, another law, then another Mexican, Indian, spirit, exile, migration, sky. The grass is mowed, then blown by a machine. Sidewalks are empty, clean, and the red-shouldered hawk peers down from an abandoned wooden dome, an empty field, it is all in between the light. Every day this changes a little. Yesterday homeless and without papers, Alberto left for Denver. A Greyhound bus, he said, where they don't check you. Walking, working, under the silver darkness. Walking, working, our mind, our life. So those are a, a few of the poems, and uh, we can move on to uh, okay. to Anthony and me. We're going to okay. do something together. Uh, I haven't really read most of these poems, so I'm so happy to read them for you, and so happy to read uh, colectivamente con el único, el poeta Antonio Cody. <laughs> All right, thank you, thank you, Juan Felipe. Do you want to do? I'm not a paid prote uh, protester first. Oh yeah, yeah. So, really, you do, so we'll do that. We'll do those. I really want to Are do you? this. All right, You're, I'll be the I'll be the inquisitor. <laughs> You'd be, you be the questioner, okay? All right. Uh, you know, because uh, on the Laureate Road, I think basically any time. But on the Laureate Road, I think I was in Ohio. And now you know how you get, you got your camera, you got your little bag, you got your satchel, you're all together, you're organized, you know, you go into your next meeting, get on the plane, get off and get a taxi, go to a hotel and go to the meeting. 
And as I stepped into the tunnel, the jetway, uh, sir, can, uh, can I talk to you? And he showed me a badge. So then I went through a set of, a set of interroga an interrogation. So let's put that aside. And this one is called, I'm not a paid protester. You are a paid protester. No. We know you are being paid. <laughs> no, 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 no. We know you are being paid at this very moment. No, oh, no, no. We know you are being funded by shadow investors. That is incorrect. We know. We know that you meet with shadow investor, investors interested in overturning our structures. I'm not concerned with your structures. As a matter of fact, you do not have any so-called structures at this time. That is what you have been instructed to say. We know. No, no, you do not. Not. You have been instructed to launch a spiral ring across the edifice to install a fracture, a severance, a crevice. What are you saying? Well, how do you know? We know. You do things, and then you do them. I'm protesting. That is all. Hey. No, you are not. I am here of my own free will. There is no such thing. How about, uh, how about some candy? There is no such thing. <laughs> you are bribing me. Hey, I don't do that. I don't do that. Of course you are. Hey, hey, I got some ginseng. No way, never. Hey, you know, uh, take my frog. Tira. You gotta be kidding. Yeah, take my frog. You are out of your mind. <laughs> It's a meditation frog. Never in your life. You can meditate with it. We're getting nowhere. Excellent, excellent, excellent. What, what? We are, we're on the way. Hey, we're on, on the way, man, we're on the way, on the way. I'm, I'm hitting the button. Get out of your bubble, man. I'm hitting the button. What button? The deportation button. Wow, man. You hear me now? Wow. You hear me? Wow. I am hitting it. It's not the deportation button. Push it. <laughs> you're, tri you're tricking me. It's the mass hypnosis button. You, you are out of your gourd, sir. Just push it, push it. I, I don't, I don't want to push it. Push it. Come on. Push it. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You win, Juan Felipe. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now, so now, as we as we close the event, thank you for uh, uh, sitting with us while we do this uh, this uh, pop up theater production here. Um, um, do you want to do the? You want to do interruption? We'll yeah. Do interruption back and forth. Let's do interruption, and you're gonna do. And I'll do the treaty. You read the. You you do your sections, and then when you're done with your section, I'll read mine. Okay. Okay. So so so. Uh, one third or one fourth into the book, I, I put a, um, where is it? Jeez, I can't see what I'm doing. 
I put an interruption. It says interruption. So I kind of interrupt, maybe, maybe not the, the flow of the poems, because it's, it's an interruption. And in this interruption, I, I wanted to stop, you know, the poetry in a way, and uh, talk about what that border is made out of. You know, what is it made out of, you know? It colors the wall, they do, you know, we have a lot of description of what it is, but what is, what is it really all about? And that's where the interruption comes in. You know, uh, it's good to see everything through as many angles as possible. And sometimes it's good to see beyond uh, the appearance and to see beyond the appearance. So this is looking at that thing called the border wall interruption. So, uh, so uh, Anthony, you want to kick it off? Why kick it off? Or uh, Tony? Will um, kick you, kick, you, kick it, you kick it off, Juan Felipe. Read the first section and then I'll come back in. Oh, yeah. I can stop. I can stop anywhere, somewhere. Yeah. The the just stop. Just read the read the whole section, and then I'll come back in. <laughs> okay, I'll read a a little a portion of section one, like section one. Oh, section one. Yeah. Push it. <laughs> 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 Underneath the wall, there's a crust of war operations. It extends far beyond the lines. It opens its fibers and cables across global nets, yes. And there are weaponized hormigas carrying out the orders underneath the wall. It is more than an arbitrary stop, or as it is called, the border. It is an arrangement of agreements of always war. Why is that when all we desire is peace, bread, water, clothes, work, a thatched roof, and humanity, most of all? Article 8. Mexicans remain defined where they now reside, being subjected or whatever. Those who remain shall be under the obligation to declare their character. Every Mexican not established shall be property. Two, we notice the interconnections of war operators when we happen to peer under the message of the wall into the apparatus. It is true. Article 12. Consider the acquired, the boundaries, the defined, the article, the present, the government. Después de la plata, corren as it falls. Three. Underneath the code of the wall, Things are always in motion while we wait to cross. Article 17, conclude the United States of America reserves to itself the right at any time to terminate the other. Article 18, of the troops shall be exempt from duties and charges of any kind. En Peña la Sombra, it shall be the duty of all to denounce the Mexican como castigado. Cuatro, yeah, we continue on the new exemplar of what life is, the one we carry as we pass, as our ancestors have for more than 170 years. Above us, the watchtowers, below, the crest of war operations inside. Article 19, with respect, Mexico, an estado ocupados, Mexican, one, Mexican shall be prohibited, two, the perfect que lleguen después, Mexican being subject to following, three, all quedarán exentos de todo derecho shall be subject to sale, four, 
all shall have been removed from every kind of title or nation. Five, merchandise, effects, property shall be removed by the forces of the United States. Las, lea, las leyes a los dueños, six, or whatever. Five, above us and in our hands and on our forehead, there is a light. We call it star, a star. A star, star, a star, a star, star, a star. Article 20, for the interest of commerce, the Mexican shall be admitted entry. Thank you, hey. Dr. Lipez. thank you. I want to, before we uh, kick it back to everyone, I just want to say I'm grateful to everyone by, for being here today. It took six months to actually make this happen in the six months. Uh, the only the only good thing that feels like has happened is Juan Felipe now has a book to read. You can get either of them um, out there in the world. Um, and just want to give it back to Gracie. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you all to who, those who came. Um, thank you for supporting Anthony, Juan Felipe, La Lab, um, Qua. Um, and then just a quick reminder, if you haven't gotten Anthony's book, um, Preferred, Publi uh, Preferred Bookseller is um, Omni Don Publishing. And if you haven't gotten um, Juan Felipe's book, uh, Preferred Bookseller is City Lights Book, City Lights Books. Um, but yeah, um, I just wanted to say it's been a great honor to be able to hear you guys read, um, old friends and new friends. Um, I really miss all of you and I hope to see all of you soon again.